So we are now on what is called chapter two in these control theory notes. And it's on stability, okay? Um, we've talked about stability of systems previously, right? Uh, stability, we talked about in terms of eigenvalues, we talked about in terms of the roots of the characteristic equation, we talked about in terms of the uh, uh, poles of a transfer function, right? And we're going to continue talking about stability uh, primarily in, in familiar terms, but we're going to have a few definitions that are a little uh, different than before. Um, so uh, we've started to talk about the sort of the, the three uh, main performance criteria that are considered for control systems. Okay, so. The three are stability, transient response, and steady state error. And we're going to say stability is the most important because if you have an unstable system, it doesn't really matter what its steady state error is or what its transient response is. It's unstable. That's like the big red flag that you should see. So uh, we're going to limit ourselves to linear time invariant LTI systems as usual in this class. Um, and before we begin discussing stability, uh, there are two different ways that we think of stability. In terms of the natural response, which so the Nice textbook calls it natural response, it's also the initial condition response, it's also the uh, called the free response. Um, there are a couple other names for it too. And then the forced response is the other one, so sometimes called the input response as well. So there's the free response from the initial conditions, and then there's the, the forced response. So we can think of stability from these two different perspectives, and so that's what we're going to do in these next two subsections. So this terminology will be used throughout the following. So the first subsection here is stability defined by the natural response. Using the, co or using the concept of the natural response, we define the following types of stability for LTI systems. And this is the type of stability you're more familiar with. Um, uh, an LTI system is asymptotically stable if the natural response approaches zero as time approaches infinity. Um, we know that from our, our uh, uh, previous discussions. Um, now, I apologize for the formatting here. I need to load a, the font in. For some reason, it changed all of my fonts to what looks like Helvetica to me. It shouldn't be. So, anyways, I'll fix that. It should be look fine on your sheets, though, if you printed them out. Um, an LTI system is unstable if the natural response grows without bound as time approaches infinity. So, there's that as well. We were familiar with that one. And then marginal stability is what happens if the natural response neither decays nor grows, but remains constant or oscillates with a constant amplitude as time approaches infinity. So th that's the little ball on the like, slopes. Too. Yeah, exactly. So like the one that's the slope in like this, um, it will be stable. If the ball is on uh, like a hilltop, it'll be unstable, it'll go off to infinity. Um, and if the ball is on a flat one, it'll just sort of it won't go back to the origin, but it won't go off to infinity. So it'll stay at some finite value. So that's the way to think about a you know, physical picture of it. Um, and that, that type of stability uh, is still what we're going to focus on, but I'm going to introduce another type of stability um, to the discussion just for awareness of another type of stability that isn't exactly equivalent, but is very similar. Um, so stability defined by the forced response. An altern alternate formulation of stability definitions um, above is called the bounded input, bounded output definition of stability. Um, and states the following. A system is, so bounded input, bounded output, the acronym is BIBO. Um, a system is BIBO stable 
if every bounded input yields a bounded output. Okay, so bounded means that it is finite. It doesn't have, it doesn't go off to infinity. It has some finite value that it doesn't get higher than or smaller than. Um, a system is uh, Bebo unstable if any bounded input yields an unbounded output. So you could have a system that maybe for um, all initial conditions goes to zero um, and for most inputs goes to zero, but for some specific input is unbounded. And it would be Bebo unstable in that case. Um, in terms of Bebo stability, marginal stability then means that a system has a bounded response to some inputs and an unbounded response to others. So here's a real example of that. So for instance, a second order undamped system, so if we had like a mass spring but no damper, an oscillator with no damping in it. It's just going to oscillate forever, right? Um, uh, where was I here? Um, yeah. An so a second order undamped system response to a sinusoidal input at the natural frequency is unbounded, whereas every other input yields a bounded output. So if you had that system and you excited it at a lower a frequency that wasn't the natural frequency, it would have some finite oscillation response. But if you excited it at the natural frequency, the, the Bode plot for that, the magnitude Bode plot, actually is infinitely peaky at the natural frequency. It's a spike, the natural frequency for a um, uh, for a, an undamped oscillator. And so that would yield an unbounded output at that frequency. So that is a, uh, an example of a marginally stable, in the Bebo sense, system. Okay. All right. Although we focus on the definitions of stability in terms of the natural response, it is good to understand Bebo stability as well, given that there are certain inputs that can yield an unbounded output for some systems that are otherwise uh, apparently stable. Okay, so that's sort of a, an introduction to stability. We're all kind of familiar with those broad, uh, at least the first type of, of broad definition of stability. And now we get into the DEETs. Right? So now we have to think about what stability means in terms of a transfer function. In controls, we're really focused on the transfer function, at least in uh, quote unquote classical controls. So, stability from the poles of a closed loop transfer function. Um, of course, we care mostly about the poles of a closed loop transfer function because we're putting a controller on it, right? We, we considered stability of just any transfer function before, and that was fine. Now we're going to focus specifically on the closed loop transfer function. So from our definitions, in terms of the natural response, uh, section uh, 2.2.1, so the previous section, uh, we see that a closed loop LTI system is asymptotically stable if all its poles have negative real parts. In other words, they're all in the left half plane. Okay? That's, we're very familiar with that idea. We talked about that before, but we didn't think about it in the last section in terms of a transfer function. Now we are. Conversely, a closed loop LTI system is unstable if it has at least one pole with a positive real part, so in the right half plane, and or has poles of multiplicity greater than one on the imaginary axis. So that's not something we've considered previously. We sort of simplified that. We didn't consider the possibility of having double poles. 
But do you remember what you do uh, when you're solving a differential equation if you have a double root to your characteristic equation? So then you just add an extra x and then something just like c to the e to the t to the cx, or c to t e to the t. Yeah, yeah. So then you'd add a factor of t to the, to the exponential e to the whatever that root is, t. But here's the thing. Um, uh, this t is unbounded. Right, and so you can end up if it's on the imaginary axis. So that if it's to the left of the imaginary axis, if you have a double root, it's not a big deal because that t term gets dominated by the negative uh, exponential is decaying. Okay, so it is bounded. But if it's on the imaginary axis, it would just oscillate forever, right? Just be a sinusoid. But if you have a t multiplied by a sinusoid, over time the amplitude grows, not exponentially, but linearly. And that gives us an unbounded output. Um, and you actually have instability. We didn't talk about that previously, but it's good to remember that. It's kind of like a, it's a freak thing to have that happen, but it can happen. Um, okay. Finally, a closed loop LTI system is marginally stable if it is not unstable, but has at least one pole with zero real part, in other words, on the imaginary axis. Um, and if none of these has multiplicity greater than one. Right? So that's what it means to be marginally stable. Um, you can have poles in the left half plane, but at least one of them shows up on the imaginary axis, which means you're going to have this infinite oscillation. Um, and it's not, it doesn't have a multiplicity greater than one, meaning it's not a double pole there. If it is a double pole there, then it, it has that phenomenon we just discussed about going off to infinity. So those are our ways of thinking about the stability of a transfer function in terms of its poles. Remember, nothing to do with its zero, it's just its poles. So let's do an example. So first off, we want to find the, so given this plant transfer function, so this is the forward path plant transfer function, find the unity negative feedback closed loop transfer function and comment on its stability, okay? Let the command be R and the output why? Okay, so let's go ahead and do this. So from example 1.1, which we did last Monday, 1.1, with the controller set to unity. So what did we do in example 1.1? Do you remember? What is unity? Just one. Uh, the closed loop transfer function is the closed loop transfer function is the result of that example 1.1 was what the closed loop transfer function is. So y over r is the output over the command is equal to, in this case, g of s, which is the plant, over 1 plus g of s. So we don't have c of s, which is the controller transfer function, because we just set it equal to 1. Um, and the reason for this is that we haven't considered any controller yet, right? We haven't talked about a controller being in there yet. Uh, so we'll set the controller to 1. And this is our closed loop transfer function. So let's plug in the g of s that's given in the problem. 
So we have 1 over s squared plus 3 over 1 plus s squared, uh, 1 over s squared plus 3. Um, and this is equal to, uh, let's drop the denominator down, multiply it by both terms. Gives us 1 over s squared plus 3 plus 1, right? Which is equal to 1 over s squared plus 4. Adding the 3 and the 1 together, I know. It's a big step. So, uh, we found the closed loop transfer function. So its poles PI can be found by solving for the values for um Solve for the values of. Oh wait, so I haven't finished that yet. Solving for the values of s for which the denominator for which the denominator move up here running out of room um, uh, is equal to zero so that is the <coughs> denominator is s squared plus 4, right? So our poles, we call them p, is p squared plus 4 equals 0. Solve for p, which is what? p1 and 2 are ah, plus or minus j2. Um, they're both imaginary. So, what does that mean about stability? So both poles are on the imaginary axis, right? And have Multiplicity one, right? Multiplicity one? Yeah, isn't that a rooting stuff, or that's because yeah. it's two different poles, technically? Uh, yeah, so these poles, so one of them is at plus J2, one is at minus J2, so they don't, they don't on top of each other. If you had two at plus J2, yeah, yeah. That would be a multiplicity of two. So that's the only reason why. Does it have anything to do with the, uh, the unity? Uh, it, so what it has to do with is um, uh, where did I use the word unity? Oh, uh, nothing to do with the controller being set to unity, no. And when I say by being set to unity, I mean just set to one. I just used that word because you're going to find that word in stuff, and it just means one. So that would be like if the controller actually had an equation, this, that one would actually be what CS would be? Uh, so, so, yeah, CS, C of S would be one. Okay. We're just setting C of S equal to one in this whole problem. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, therefore, we have a marginal 
stability. Right? So that's, that makes sense. Everything that we've seen so far, you know, that makes sense for all of that. The one thing that we did was we found the closed loop transfer function before we found stability. So, oh, I didn't bring in my special character. It's this. So, stability from the form of a closed loop transfer function. So, it turns out that we don't know how to find the poles of a high order uh, transfer function here analytically. I mean, you can go, I forget what order, fourth order maybe at the, at the most. Um, fifth is maybe solved, but it's like multiple pages. So the quadratic equation and the cubic equation and then et cetera. Uh, but numerically, you can go to very high order and MATLAB or Python or whatever you feel like using Mathematica uh, will find those roots quite accurately um, just fine. But uh, we don't um, we don't want always to find them numerically because sometimes we're designing something that we want to find the closed loop transfer function poles for, like s squared plus 4. Um, this may be some really large polynomial, but instead of having 4 and 1 be our coefficients, and 0 for s, um, we might have like uh, some parameter, like the damping coefficient could be in here, uh, an unset parameter we haven't set yet. And so finding those roots analytically is what we would desire so we could solve for what B should be to make something the way that we want it. But we, we can't, we can't uh, do that solution numerically if we don't have the parameters set. So you can set it a bunch of times and then solve it a bunch of times, which is something you can do in MATLAB. We'll talk about that later. But um, for now, what we want to do is we want to learn how to learn things about the stability of the closed loop transfer function from the form of it in the polynomial, but not necessarily uh, all solved out for all of the poles. Okay? So say you don't know what it is all factored out with all the poles. Um, what can we learn about stability? So let A and B be constant coefficients and the denominator of a closed loop transfer function be this polynomial where we have b n s to the n so it's an nth order system and we have these two forms we have this polynomial form and then we have this factored form here where a1 through a n are actually poles right um, well yeah so they are poles, because if you suck A1 in here, then A1 minus A1 would be 0. So they are poles. So if a system is stable, it must have all left half plane poles. So all of the AI, which are the poles, right, must have negative real parts, which non-obviously implies that these next two conditions are true. Um, all bi must be positive, so all of these coefficients of the polynomial must be positive. And additionally, all of the bi, all of the b's here, must be non-zero for i less than or equal to from zero to n. In other words, no missing powers of s. So you can't have a polynomial. Well, so what it says is, if the system is stable, then it's going to have all positive non-zero coefficients of the polynomial. Okay. However, these conditions are merely, these BI conditions are merely necessary conditions for stability. Meaning, 
that they are necessary for stability, but not sufficient. Meaning that we would need to know something more to say for sure that it's stable. Um, we can, however, identify if something is not stable uh, just from the form. So, however, if they're not met, this is a sufficient condition to draw the conclusion that the control system is unstable. In other words, nothing more is needed. So, who here has taken logic of any sort? They don't teach it anymore. They need to teach logic. Um, necessary and sufficient conditions are important ideas. Um, if a condition is necessary for something to be true, if that is not met, then the thing can't be true. If it's sufficient, that means it can't not be true. <laughs> like a whole like, month on that in philosophy class. Yeah. Well, no. Nice. Oh, you have Pratt, don't you? Yeah, this is when I was going to college. Ah. Pratt does logic here, doesn't he? I think he's told me he does it. He does. I bet on it. <laughs> if you can understand what Pratt's saying. Yeah. Oh. I think that claim is sufficient. Yeah. So, let's do, let's do, since I know we're not all logic gurus here, uh, let's do some examples. So, stability of a closed loop transfer function by inspection. Um, so given these four closed loop transfer functions, so I'm, I'm giving you the closed loop ones, uh, comment on the stability of each without solving for poles. Okay? So let's, yeah. One should be good in some that form. Well, it's not, not unstable. Right, well, so actually, uh, this one, the poles are all obvious, right? They're negative 3, negative 10, and negative 22. From the form, they're all negative poles, therefore stable, right? And on the next page, I left you room to comment on this in more detail. We're just going to have a short discussion because we're out of time. Um, G2, what can we say about the stability of this? So one of these, one of these coefficients, one of the b's in terms of this, is negative, right? Not cool. Which is not cool. Which means, does it mean that it might be unstable, or does it mean that it's definitely unstable? Uh, we know for sure from this that it's not stable. We don't know if it, it and actually, uh, I didn't go into the details of that. I believe we, mean, we know that it's actually unstable, but it's definitely not stable. It might be marginally stable. I think a missing power means marginally stable. Um, or a missing coefficient means marginally stable. But in any, way, in any case, it's definitely not stable. So we can say that. Not stable. What about this one? You're missing your second power. Yeah, missing. So there's a missing power. So that means that one of these coefficients is zero, right? So the B uh, two coefficient is zero. So therefore, it must be not stable. This one. Um, notice I, I put on all of these, you know, zeros and whatever, but we haven't looked at the numerator at all. Doesn't affect stability. Doesn't affect stability. So there's a denominator of this one as to the fourth, third, second, first, zeroth. So all of the all of the coefficients are there. None of them are negative. So what can we say? Potentially stable, but we don't know for sure that it's stable. We would need to find out more information. Okay, and that's what on Wednesday we'll talk about how to find out more about stability without having to solve for the roots. <laughs>
If we solve for the roots, it's easy. Uh, but if we want to avoid solving for them, how do we do it? We'll find out on Wednesday.